Welcome back to F1 Nation. This is Ask the Nation. We've got a lot of questions. You've been asking us a lot of questions throughout the season. And while we've got a bit of a holiday, we've got time to go through them all. And Tom is going to help me with Natalie to get the answers you so desperately need to all these burning questions about Formula 1. Talking of answers, before we get on with Ask the Nation, um, Damon, have you got over your loss to Natalie in the F1 Nation quiz last week? Well, you didn't have to bring it up, Tom, but thanks for reminding me. Um, I'm I'm suffering a little bit, I have to be honest. You know, I, I, Crestfallen is probably um, not strong enough of a term to use. I think I, you're like Fernando Alonso. I think life is a competition for you, Damon, and therefore I think this yeah, will have yeah. really, really, some some level it will have affected you. Has it affected you on the golf course? Well, I think the thing is, it's the equilibrium. The family life has suffered. Um, you know, the, the wife is not too happy with me. And uh, they've learned to, to avoid me, give me space. He's been uh, going around his house walking like that. <laughs> <laughs> and saying, Georgie, do you understand? Do you know who that is? It's your husband. I've been having nightmares as well. I'll tell you about that. So I've been, I can hear myself talking really, really slowly. It's like I'm swimming through treacle. For those who weren't able to listen to last week's show, and please do, it's really good fun, our quiz. Um, we slowed down some drivers commenting on various things, and one of them was Damon celebrating his 1996 world title, and he didn't recognise his own voice. That is what Pinks is referring to there. Well, should we get on and answer some questions? Um why don't I read out the first one? It's from Andy in Nottingham in the UK. And hi there, Andy. Thank you very much for your question. And Andy asks, other than Red Bull, obviously, which team do you think has had the best season so far? Aston Martin for their great start. McLaren for turning things around. Williams for not being bottom of the Constructors' Championship. Let me know. Thanks. Well, guys, what do we think? Who's had the best season so far? Other than Red Bull. Well, you know, had you asked me at the beginning of the season, obviously I would have said Aston Martin, but they've just fallen away inexplicably. And it seems to have puzzled them as much as it has us as fans. We wanted to see them up there. Remember when Fernando made that bold claim that he was never going to finish off the podium again and, and that just fell away horribly. I have to say McLaren. I mean, to think that Lando had three P17s earlier this season in Bahrain, Saudi and Miami. And then to be finishing on the podium, consecutive races in Silverstone and Hungary, and then to be really in the fight and Piastri having an awesome weekend in Spa before that horrible moment in, in lap one, turn one um, for the race itself. Yeah, McLaren have been nothing short of remarkable. And I think actually what it should do is give hope to the others that, you know, an upgrade like that can really turn the season back around for them well and the upgrade that Aston Martin brought this year I mean I think I think we need a bit of context when we're talking about who's had the best season so far other than Red Bull and I think you know let's not forget that Aston Martin were seventh in the Constructors Championship last year they were they've been second for much of this year so far okay they're very close to Mercedes in third now six podiums in the opening eight races they get my vote for best so far I think McLaren were desperately disappointing given that they were fifth in the Constructors Championship last year desperately disappointing early doors this year yes the transformation has been amazing but I think if you look at the 12 races as a whole Aston get my vote Aston at you because of the the 12 races you think yeah that's interesting okay so you're including the whole season you're putting it in the context of the whole season but the, as we know Formula One is all about your last race isn't it just about to say that you're only as good as your last race. I mean, you'd have to say the trend for Aston has been is plateaued, hasn't it? And they've sort of been overtaken. They might even have gone backwards a little bit. I, uh, I think they have. And I Fer don't think it's plateauing. I think they've plummeted. Yeah. Well, and Ferrari basically have had their hiccups as well. Um, been sort of up and down all season. Uh, and I would, I'm going to throw someone else in there to consider because I would agree with Natalie. I think it's McLaren have had the the best season because they're they're on an up right now. They are. They must be going into the summer break thinking this is great because we've gone the right way and we can keep going this way now we we know we're, what we're doing and the other team will be Williams who although they haven't been right at the sharp end they they haven't half done a fantastic job with probably minimal resources to get to where they are now and they definitely also have turned a corner 
I mean, Williams have been great. What was it? Seventh in Canada, eighth in Silverstone. Albon could have scored loads of points in Melbourne as well, but he, he had that off. So, yeah, it's... it's Funnily enough, coming into this year, I thought it was going to be a year of transition for Williams. You know, James Val's new team principal from coming from Mercedes. But it's not a transitional year. This is a, a progressive year. They've seventh in the world in the world championship now from tenth. And who's who's to say what they're going to achieve in, in the second half of the year as they bring some updates to the car? And Albon is driving with so much confidence as well. I love watching that guy at work. They've just signed Pat Fry as well. So there's going to be a lot more strength in the management um, with James Fowles is you know years of experience of Mercedes and Pat's not joining until first of November though so I think we're not going to see his true influence until next year but I'm going to go off a little bit of a tangent here to the question but this whole business of gardening leave and people not being able to go from one team to another I think is not in the spirit of the sport if you see what I mean I mean I think people should be able to go okay I'm leaving and I'm going to start immediately at another team. I'd think that that would sharpen things up a bit and probably bring teams a bit closer. I, I, I just think that the whole business of a team being able to stop someone using their skills and immediately somewhere else has meant that it's harder for other teams to get up. I think that fluidity is what is going to bring teams closer together and make it much harder for teams to get away. I don't think anyone is going to disagree with you, Damon. And and Formula One is a people sport now more than it's ever been. All the teams have got the same amount of money now. And so it is a people sport. And if you're trying to hire someone, as you say, and you can't get hold of them for 18 months, then it just delays everything and, and makes life incredibly difficult. Anyway, that was the answer to the question is McLaren, isn't it? I think, Natalie, I think you know it's, it's pretty obvious that they've had a fantastic turnaround in their season and they're, they're running a competitive car, one that other teams are looking at and thinking, wow, that's that's a strong package. And Oscar's Oscar's performance has been great. So they got Lando and Oscar, two really good young drivers, and they'll be feeling cock a hoop about the season so far. That's how to do it. Yeah. This leads nicely into the next question from Stephen Walton in New Zealand. Uh, thanks for getting in touch, Stephen. Um, and he says, I'd be interested to know your predictions for when Red Bull will be beaten and who will be the driver team to do it. Do you know what? There's part of me that doesn't want them to be beaten because they've come this far and I want them to do something utterly remarkable and win every race of the season. Do you mean that? I do. I really do. Because I think we'll look back and recognise this was a real moment in history and it was a privilege to witness it. So if you're going to break a record, absolutely smash it. But I don't know whether it's the law of averages, Murphy's law, someone's law, something will happen, you know, and there'll be reliability or someone will take Max out or Perez. Or there'll, there'll be something where he doesn't finish on the top step because it's just, it, it looks all too easy. It's not. I think that's the key. It really isn't as easy as they're making it look. Yes, of course, they've got the fastest car and arguably the best driver in the fastest car. But the truth is, your stars have to be aligned to win a Grand Prix. Things have to go. And you, I mean, think about, think about the sprint. Think about the pit stops when, um, when Piastri dived into the pit stops and, and Max hung out there. You know, like had, they all came in, but there could have easily been a collision in that. Now, I know that wasn't a Grand Prix, so it doesn't statistically count. Things happen in races that are beyond their control. So they've done incredibly well to get this far. And, you know, there's part of me that just wants them to go all the way. I read a quote from Ron Dennis once saying that the greatest frustration of his career was the collision that Ayrton Senna had with Jean-Louis Schlesser at the first chicane at Monza in 1988, which ended up preventing McLaren from getting that clean sweep that Pink so wants Red Bull to do this year. It's like a Ming vase, isn't it? It's all, what is that that stone with the, is it the Pink Panther with the little floor in it? Uh, but anyway, you know, it's like the thing that is the floor that makes the, the gem even more perfect in a way. Uh, but the odds of winning all the races in a 23 race season are, they must, I don't know, I haven't looked, but I think the odds are still going to be pretty long. But the consecutive wing victories, I think that, Max is going to blow that into the weeds. I think there's a good chance of doing that on his own, let alone the team record. They've beaten that one already, haven't they? 12 wins in a row. 
as a team. Do you guys believe in momentum? Because I feel the summer break has come at a bad time for Red Bull. I think when you're on that roll, you just don't want to stop, do you? No, I I, I 100% believe in momentum. I know that Max Verstappen doesn't. He makes a point of saying that it's a theory he doesn't concur with. But if you look at Sergio Perez, I think, you know, a bad run of form can really bog you down and it's difficult to break out of that. It becomes a mindset. Um, The same can be said for a decent finding the groove. George Russell said at the weekend, we just need to find our groove. And for me, that is momentum. So does anyone think Mercedes are going to be the team to beat Red Bull? I mean, that's the point, isn't it? It could actually be Ferrari, Mercedes, McLaren, Aston Martin. And that's what has provided the entertainment this season. There's so much else going on elsewhere. So we can't call it. I mean, they've all had their moments in the sun. It's who gets it at the right time and who's, again, stars are aligned to a topple max on their day. You know, it could be any one of them. This episode is sponsored by Shopify. If you're a side hustle superstar out there that needs a little extra support to help your business reach its full potential, Shopify has got your back. Shopify is revolutionising millions of businesses worldwide by simplifying selling online and in person, leaving you to focus on successfully growing your business and your brand without even needing to pick up any new skills like design or code, because Shopify handles it all for you. It doesn't matter if you're selling bespoke jewellery, baseball caps or birthday cards. No matter what your speciality, Shopify has every sales channel covered from an in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform. It even helps you sell across social media marketplaces like TikTok, Facebook and Instagram. But what I think is really great is that it's packed with industry tools designed to help you elevate your business in a way that suits your personal goals. If you're hungry for more knowledge, you can get access to their extensive business course library. And if you need just a little day-to-day help and guidance, their support team is on hand 24-7. So while you focus on the creative side, Shopify is right there beside you working hard on the rest, empowering you with the tools that you need to grow your business on your own terms and make it the success you've always dreamed of. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. So what are you waiting for? Now it's your turn to get serious about selling and try Shopify today. Sign up for a £1 per month trial period at shopify.co.uk slash nation, all lowercase. Go to shopify.co.uk slash nation to take your business to the next level. Shopify.co.uk slash nation. Fernando Leon from Rio in Brazil has asked, what are your projections for a Brazilian driver for the near future in Formula One? So just to give you an idea of the contenders, we've got Felipe Drogovic, who is Aston Martin's reserve driver and last year's F2 champion. We've got Enzo Fittipaldi, who is uh, in Formula Two at the moment. He won the sprint race in Belgium and was on the podium for the feature race. 18-year-old Gabriel Bortoletto from Sao Paulo is on the verge of winning Formula 3. Fernando Alonso is his manager. Uh, Lewis Hamilton. Aha, but he's not Brazilian, I hear you say. Well, he is, really. He's got an honorary Brazilian citizenship. (laughs) Kind of qualifies. So, yeah, they're your contenders. What do you think? I think it feels weird that there's no Brazilian driver in Formula One at the minute because for as long as I've been following it, let alone being involved with this with Formula One, there's, well, until recently, always been a Formula a Brazilian Formula One driver. And you know, when we go to Interlagos every year, the passion for the sport over there and all the Senna murals, Felipe Massa still coming to lots of races as an ambassador for Formula One. But where are the Brazilian F1 drivers? And of the list that you've just been through, Pinks, I mean, my guess is Enzo Fittipaldi is closest. He's in a Red Bull junior. So he's getting those early morning phone calls from Helmut Marco. And he uh, won his first Formula Two race just before the summer break in Belgium, as you said. He's probably closest. But is there the buzz about him that there is someone, you know, like remember Oscar Piastri when he was winning in Formula 2? We all knew that his future was Formula 1. I wouldn't say that 
that were saying that about Enzo Fittipaldi. Felipe Drogovic won the F2 Championship last year, is only the reserve driver this year. He's been slightly overlooked. Pietro Fittipaldi, okay, he tested the Haas at the Pirelli test at Silverstone a couple of months ago, but ah, come on, Brazil. Drogovic was poised to step in for Lance Stroll at the beginning of the season, if you remember, when Lance had his injuries from his biking accident. Uh, and then, as you say, it's his name sort of has sort of fallen off everyone's lips. And that's the problem when you don't drive. I mean, I know Piastri had some time out, but you need to really be competing, he I think, to be kept himself in the headlines. For <laughs> well, yeah, he did. But you need to be racing and competing to remain on people's radars. The other thing to, to point out here is, yes, I mean, you've got some good drivers. They're all, they've all got to be pretty good of a standard. And you don't know how they're going to develop. You don't know what they're going to go into, become when they get the opportunity or break in, in F1. But let's, if they ever get there. But you know that there are certain people who stand out even before they ever get anywhere near Formula 1. You know, why did they trip over themselves to get Kimi Raikkonen? Um, for Sauber and stuff you know it was a lot of people just even they do a couple of Kimi didn't even do F3 he just did Formula Renault went straight into F1 and certain drivers like Ayrton Senna you get a buzz about the Michael Schumacher there's a buzz about them before they get anywhere near Formula 1 and until you get that Ayrton Senna factor you know about a person then you can't honestly say that they've got what it takes you know you'll know about them and, and at the moment people are still having to I mean Felipe Drugovic has done some good stuff in F2 but you, you need to be knocking spots off of everyone in the lower formula and that's that's the marker that's the one that will make how that marker will just go we'll have him or uh, and of course that is the, the other challenge isn't it for uh, women racing drivers is They've got to really stand out, and that's they, they will stand out because everyone will know. But before they, long before they get anywhere near uh, Formula One, there are two girls doing great things in single seaters at the minute. Uh, Marta Garcia uh, is leading the F1 Academy with six wins, so she's she's going really well. And Sophia Flush just last time out in Belgium became the first woman to score points in Formula Three. So they're worth talking about in terms of. Are we going to see them in Formula One? Equally, you know, you've got all the young academy drivers from Alpine, Jack Doohan, Victor Martins, both have won races in Formula Two. Jack being, of course, son of five-time MotoGP world champion Mick Doohan. Teo Porcher, Sauber young driver, is leading the F2 championship at the minute. Fred Vesti was leading it until Spa. He's going to be testing the Mercedes in Mexico later this year in FP1. I mean... There's a lot of talent and not an awful lot of seats in Formula One. For me, Jack Doohan is an exciting prospect. He did really well in Belgium this time around, winning the feature race. He uh, was P1 in Budapest, wasn't he? And uh, he nearly, I mean, he was talked about for the Alpine seat. His name was in the mix along with Esteban Ock and Pierre Gasly. He's also just a really nice guy, so I just want to give him a shout out. But to Fernando's point, our friend from Brazil, none of them are Brazilian. Sorry about that, Fernando. It's one of those countries that show so much passion for their their involvement in Formula One and their history. They've got a great history in Formula One. And so, yeah, we really would love to see um, a hotshot Brazilian back to, to carry on that tradition. Um, Right, guys, this, this question is coming from Jerry Deacon. What is it actually like to work at the races? I work in the airline industry and often see F1 people boarding flights. Does it actually feel like work when you're at the racetrack? Hmm. Right. It probably feels more like work when you're trying to get a flight home uh, and you're very tired and, uh, yeah, you're going to the airport. But that is, of course, what um, Jerry does for a living. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's lots of good points about the sport. I think we're very lucky to, to have a sport to, to work in like Formula One. Tom probably works the hardest of, of all of us. Natalie works very hard as well. And I, and I occasionally do some hard work. <laughs> we can't even remember which is his last race. He, he worked so little in Austria, he didn't even remember being there. That's true. Um, but, um, no, because he doesn't feel like work. You see, it, just, it, does, it is enjoyable. There is a lot to enjoy in it and, and, and get from it because there's a lot happening. There's one thing. So it's, I like to have my mind occupied by something. Um, and Formula One gives loads of things for you to 
to concentrate on, which is which is good. Yeah, there are so many layers to it, aren't there? It's the onion, isn't it? The more you peel away, the more you discover. But I always think of Formula One as a lifestyle. It's not. I don't see it as a job. I see it as a lifestyle because it's so all-consuming for 10 months of the year that it is your life. And it's no violins, but it, it, it's very difficult for family members to come to terms with it when you're always away. And But you do it because you love it. You love the adrenaline rush in Pink's case of live TV, I guess. And then if you're a driver, you love the adrenaline of when the lights go out. And everyone gets their kicks from different things. And, you know, we go to some fantastic places. So, no, it doesn't feel like work, Jerry. I've got to tell you. <laughs> you know, Jerry, the bottom line is we are really lucky t- to work in the sport we love. And what's the old adage? Find something that you enjoy and it won't feel like work? Yeah, some, it, 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 you'll never work a day in your life if you if you find something you there love. You you'll go. never work a day in your life. But I think everyone works really hard. I mean, the truth is in F1, everybody works really hard. And when they get on the flight home, everyone conks out. You don't need to turn the lights out. They literally are asleep by the time they sat down. I don't know, though. I'm not. I find it really hard to unwind if we've been on air for like six hours. I find it really hard. In fact, I don't actually even get to sleep when I get home. I have to sort of pace around a bit and unwind very gradually. It's really the Monday and Tuesday that I feel completely knackered. That's interesting. And for the drivers, Damon, how long does it take to wind down after a Grand Prix? Same as Natalie just described them. When we were racing, you'd get back, you'd go to sleep, but then you'd wake up next morning or still bouncing around. And then Tuesday, bang, you just want to lie on the sofa and go to sleep, watch a film or something. But you've got to go testing. That's in my day, we used to go testing. So that was, that was not good. Tuesday, off again to go testing. But um, yeah, it, it drains you. It definitely does drain you. You need to recharge the batteries somewhere. And now that we've all got our media heads on, um, do you guys get competitive about wanting to break stories, be first with something? Well, there's a pressure to do that, certainly. And I think you always have to sort of weigh it up whether... What's the most important thing? To break the story, to get it right, you know, because there's a balance there, isn't there? And also not to be intrusive. I mean, I don't... I mean, I know I would be probably considered a journalist, but I don't... I'd rather protect the people within the paddock than reveal some scoop. Um, For me, that's not my motivation. I would rather understand that there are humans behind all of this. And it's it's not down to me to break a story about someone get, getting sacked. Cause for me, it's more important that we protect that person if they've, you know, having a difficult time. I know that sounds a bit wet on my part, but I think we've got to remember we're all humans and everyone's under a huge amount of pressure. So for me, it's more about understanding what makes people tick and do kind of personality-driven pieces rather than breaking a story per se. But Natalie, Tom is a bit different because Tom started off as a as a scribbler. He started off writing for magazines and his job was to find out what was going on behind the scenes and then break it on some Wednesday or something Thursday when the, when the magazine came out. Isn't that right, Tom? Uh, not really, actually, because it was a, it was a features based magazine, which I always think slightly different. I, I, I'm, I'm with Pink's. I think being the news hound has never been my thing. I like to try and just make people feel comfortable and want to talk and share their stories. Actually, I've, I've done you a disservice. You're absolutely, you're absolutely right. That is what you do, and you do that really well. And I'm not just, you know, blank smoke every skirt out. But and, and hence, if anyone hasn't listened to it, we have a sister podcast called Beyond the Grid. I sit down for an hour with someone every week, and I love doing that. Not because I want to get scoops. I just want to speak to people about about what they do and why they're good at it. And and again, I'm not just saying it because it's you Tom but I mean I listen to those and I can't believe how amazingly revealing it's not revealing it's it's just you've got time to get across you're so knowledgeable that what happens is you get to the person's soul in a way in those interviews and they feel comfortable with you because they know that you know their story and they start to tell you about their story and I've learned so much from those podcasts uh, Damon, more sorry, than, than, yeah. can I just interrupt for a second here? The quiz is over, <laughs> you lost, yeah. yes. stop brown-nosing yes. the headmaster here. <laughs> but I honestly, I'm, I'm being absolutely 100% sincere. And, and, no, and I know, it is a great podcast. It's a great series, and if people listening want to learn more about 
people, contemporary people in the sport, and also what the whole life story is. I mean, you've got Netflix out there as well. That you know they show a, they show the action and the drama of the season. But if you want to imagine sitting down with a glass of beer or a glass of wine or a glass of water, whatever it is you drink, or a coffee, and having a chance to listen to the the, the people tell their story, the the um, Beyond the Grid podcasts are, are fascinating and and uh, worth every second. Totally agree. And I totally agree with you, TC, that there's something exploitative about breaking a news story. It feels as something of a hollow victory. Like, so what? You're the first to say it. Like, let that be their news. You know, when a driver says I'm moving teams, let that be their news. Don't break it before they've had the chance to do it on their terms. I'm actually reminded of when Felipe Massa (laughs) broke the news that Jean Todd had finally got round to marrying the love of his life, Michelle Yeoh. And Felipe put it on social media before Jean Todd had the chance to. Jean phrased it in a very kind, diplomatic way there. It seems that my other son has chosen to uh, be very discreet here. The news hound, Felipe Massa. Does it? I think the question started off as, does it feel like work? The answer is no. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. This episode is sponsored by Factor. If you want to save time, eat well and stay on track to reach your health goals this summer, you need to know about our friends at Factor. Factor offers convenient, ready-to-eat meal kits that can help you fuel up fast with flavourful and nutritious meals that are delivered straight to your door, meaning no prep and no mess and no grocery store trips because all their meals arrive fresh and ready to heat and eat in just two minutes. Yes, two minutes. Treat yourself to more than 34 weekly delicious options like bruschetta shrimp risotto and grilled steakhouse filet mignon. I'd recommend the jalapeno mac and cheese if you like a little bit of kick in your food. And their shredded chicken bowl was a big hit for us too. The chicken was cooked perfectly and the dish was super filling, as tasty as any home-cooked meal. And if you don't have access to a microwave on your busy days, make sure you explore their fantastic lunch-to-go options, where you'll find effortless, wholesome meals like grain bowls and salad toppers that are ready to eat whenever you need them. No matter what your health goals are, Factor has options to suit a variety of lifestyles, from keto to calorie-smart, vegan and veggie. If you need that extra protein hit, then check out their Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. Prepared by chefs and approved by dietitians, each meal has all of the ingredients you need to feel satisfied all day long. They've even got refreshing cold-pressed juices, shakes, smoothies and nutritious snacks to choose from as well. This August, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavour-packed meals delivered to your door. No prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash nation50 and use the code nation50 to get 50% off. That's code nation50 at factormeals.com slash nation50 to get 50% off. Okay, now we've got a couple of questions specifically for the champ. So let's bring it back to our old favourite feature, Ask Dave. All about me. All about you, baby. Right. Hi, Tom and the team. Love the F1 Nation pod along with Beyond the Grid. Is this you, Damon, again? Have you put questions to yourself? (laughs) I wanted to get your thoughts on the start of the 1998 Belgium Grand Prix. As a David Coulthard fan, I get a little irked by him by being blamed for causing the multi-car crash that ultimately led to Damon's win. I actually think it may have been triggered by another driver, Eddie Irvine. If you watch the footage, Eddie exits turn one ahead of DC, but emerges from the spray behind the McLaren and deep in the carnage. Maybe Damon needs to thank Eddie Irvine for triggering that chain of events that led to the victory, as well as great driving, of course, and not DC. I still remember the podium celebration with the masking tape on the ear. Why couldn't someone have just mentioned it to you, Damon? From Ollie, an old pom in Melbourne. Hi, Ollie. Good day, mate. Oh, well, you don't do that because you're English, so sorry, you're a pom. Um, but um, yeah, you know, I'll start. I'll work backwards. The, the bit of tape. So there's a picture of me on the podium. I've got this white thing sticking on my ear. And I used to use that tape to keep my earplugs in because they used to fall out. And and then, of course, you imagine you're driving a Formula One car and your earplug falls out. And also that's the radio. So it was important to have it stuck. But yes, you're right. They could have said, 
for God's sake, take that sticky tape off your ear. You look silly. Um, so I'm on the podium having won my last race with a bit of white sticky tape on my ear. Um, but I have to disappoint you. I'm terribly sorry. I'd love to blame Eddie Irvine for the big crash at the start of the Belgian Grand Prix, but it wasn't him. It was DC. And I know that because I was right behind him when it happened. Yes! Yes! It's go! And Hacken gets away. Well, look at Eddie Irvine coming up on the inside. Field no, goes up into second position. Schumacher is down into about sixth position. Bad start by the Ferrari. Great start by Eddie Irvine. Field up. Look at Field up. And into the wall. Who was that? Coulthard. It's Coulthard Coulthard. 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 Coulthard into the wall. Maybe Coulthard into the wall will stop the race. They'll have to race. They'll have to race. They'll have to race. Oh, this is terrible. Look, oh, this is quite appalling. This is the worst start for a Grand Prix that I have ever seen in the whole of my life. And how anyone got out of that. I mean, quite a few cars didn't. But um, what an absolute catastrophe of a a first first lap shunt that was. Well, as Ollie says, if you look at the YouTube footage... Coulthard hits the wall on the inside, exiting La Source, if I'm right. Almost takes you out. Almost takes you out. There's then a restart. Damon Hill takes the lead into turn one from P3 on the grid. Schumacher overtakes you. Schumacher crashes into Coulthard. Coulthard's had a bad day, hasn't he, really? He, he wasn't he a good causes day. The first, he causes yeah. the first crash. Has Schumacher almost try and beat him up after... Those two collide late on in the race and Damon wins. I mean... High drama. High drama. But you had to sit through two hours of, or uh, maybe more, of, of TV to get the conclusion of that because it was... Well, I think the race, the race was two hours and then we had an hour before because they were cleaning up the mess before that. So that's three hours. And then whatever you do before, half an hour before that as well. So it was a good, it was a good epic of a race, that one. Um, but um, yeah, I do have to report that I... DC hit a drain cover and lost traction and that's what spat him into the wall and I could see that happening. I had to make a decision. Do I go to where he's crashed because I knew that he'd bounce off the wall or do I try and make it past the back of his car and go for the gap? And somehow or other I got through without being taken out by DC's flying and McLaren. I think DC even ran wide at Lake Homme on one lap as well. Just another thing. DC, I hope you're not listening. No, it was difficult conditions for everyone. Right, now we have a question to test your memory, Damon. And quite frankly, your performance in the quiz last week suggests that we may struggle. Hello, Damon. This is Peter from Canada. I just want to ask you about the FW16, the 1994 Williams, how you felt about the rear suspension. I heard that you preferred the uh, FW15D rear suspension compared to the the new model of the 16. Can you elaborate on... uh, the details of that suspension and how well you thought it worked and how you went about improving it. And was, in your view, that suspension perhaps responsible for the lack of traction compared to the Benetton out of slow corners? Thank you. Bye. Right, Peter, that's a, that's an interesting question. Going back a long way to uh, the misty past of 94, I actually it was bad. Actually, suspension, the one that dominated with Williams in 93, Alan Prost won his fourth world title using that car and Williams were dominant with the active suspension, but they banned it uh, for 94. So Williams had to go back to using conventional suspension, what they call passive suspension. And there was something that we found difficult in setting up this car. And it was, it was a problem. And of course, uh, 94 was a, was a tragic season because we also lost and Senna and Ayrton's experience of driving the car was that it was a very difficult car to drive as I found as well so there was something about going back to the passive suspension that made um, us scratch our heads a bit uh, to try and get the right setup so we struggled quite a lot with with setting the car up for 94 it got better as the season went on but Benetton um, a bit like you'd have to say like Red Bull done this year they've got it right and Benetton had it right for uh, the new regulations and I think that we struggled and Ayrton was being Ayrton was determined never to give up even if the car wasn't handling to his liking so he he pressed on and actually in Brazil um, he lost control of the car because I think he was probably worn out I mean I, I was miles behind him I just found the car very very difficult to drive but but Ayrton was someone who 
fought the car. You know, he would take the car to places it didn't want to go. And so, yes, I would say that uh, the, the suspension lacked something, lacked a bit of compliance, which made it uh, a bit of a handful. You remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. Hey, Damon, did you prefer active or passive suspension? Um, I think I prefer passive suspension. The active suspension was fun. I mean, you could do all sorts of tricks with it. But the, the, the thing about the passive suspension was you could also adapt it to how you like to, you know, your style of driving a little bit more than the, the active, um, which you kind of, you know, it because it could do anything almost, then where's the limit? If you, if you know, you're ask you're, you're trying, you, you, if you're given a compromise, you're given a kind of like, okay, I need a bit of this, I need a bit of that. And you kind of bake your cake. You know, you, it's like setting up a car for you. It's like it's like making some some delicious dish. You know, and eventually you get the combination right, and the and the car is beautiful to drive, and you feel satisfied that you've done that. Whereas with the active car, the computer did it, and you weren't really sure where you could take any credit for that. I think that was that was where I think the art came from the passive suspended cars, which um, which perhaps you know we didn't with. Um, with a computer control one, that was really much down to the engineers and the brilliance of people like Paddy Lowe and uh, and Adrian Newey and uh, Patrick Head and the rest of them. Go on. So to Peter's question, the slow corner performance of the Williams versus the Benetton. Yes. I, what are you suggesting? Which was quicker? <laughs> I think <laughs> I'm, I'm not suggesting. I'm, I'm, I'm anything. going to get. I'm going to stick my neck out here and say the traction was better on the Benetton than it was on the Williams. <laughs> Shall we just leave I it there? Leave it. <laughs> Peter, thank you for that voice note. Great to hear from you. And let's do one more question uh, from Colin Hobmer, uh, who asks, do you think it would be better if the driver had to use all tyre compounds during the race? What do we think? At the minute, they have to use two. Yeah, I think definitely there's, there's an argument to say that if you're going to look for excitement and a, a little bit more of a challenge then then why not i think that's a that's a, a good idea i have heard it put before um but it would increase the number of pit stops it would you know so you'd get less of the one stop factor i mean it's quite interesting that you've got to the stage now where they've they build a gap max has built a gap and in, in the last race we had in belgium where when lewis built a gap enough to be able to come in for a new set of tires and do a uh, the fastest lap and get one point, you know, that that's a bit of drama that at, at first was thought to be a bit of a gimmick, but actually now teams are deciding that's really important to have that. We want to have that that scalp. And so they, they come in and, and do the one lap stop. But that's a bit of drama at the end of the race. And um, so having to use all three compounds would th throw another challenge in there. So, um, yeah, I think it's possibly a good thing. Teams don't like being told, don't like being prescribed things, do they? Like when the alternative tyre allocation came in in Hungary. Uh, remember, we were meant to have it at Imola, but of course uh, that race didn't take place. But in Hungary, you, know, you had to use the hard tyre in Q1, the medium tyre in Q2 and the soft tyre in Q3. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we got a really jumbled up grid um, because the good teams weren't able to use Q1 and Q2 to perfect their cars on the soft tyre because they were being forced to use the hard tyre and the medium tyre. And it just meant that there wasn't quite the level of perfection in Q3 that we're used to. And as a result, we saw a different guy on pole, Lewis Hamilton. We saw two Alfa Romeos in Q3 and it led to a load of excitement in qualifying. So why not introduce it for the race? I'd love it. As ever... With my esteemed colleagues, I'm in full agreement with you both. I think, why not? I mean, the only the only thing that when I was talking to, well, when we were talking to Christian Horner after the Belgian Grand Prix, Tom, it really struck me just how much the teams are put through on a race weekend and the sprint format more than ever. So if you add in another factor to this already complicated puzzle that they're trying to unpick, it may be a bit unfair. Nobody likes to look foolish, but obviously the rain, the rain affected races, the ones where you can't really predict what's going to happen, those are the ones that throw up the most drama and challenge for all the races. Uh, you know, and, and people come away not knowing themselves, not being able to predict it themselves. And, that, and I think those are entertaining. So you, you have to be careful. You're, you're throwing yourself open to the accusation of making unnecessary 
drama, just gimmicks, you know. Um, but I just think, why not a third? You know, they've got the tyres there anyway. Um, so, yeah, having to use all three tyres, that would mean that, of course, if they were to go to a track with a very, very soft, soft tyre, um, that would be almost impossible to use in the race for more than a couple of laps. But oh, 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 guys, what about mixing the compounds like they do in MotoGP, where don't you see some bikes with the hard tyre on, on the rear and the soft tyre on the front and really jumbles it up? Frank Williams started his, his Grand Prix career, career doing that because he actually um, put the wrong tyres on the front of the F2, or I think it was an F2 car it was running at the time because he didn't know what the hell he was doing. And so somebody realised that that this man is a liability, but if he's, if he's got a spanner in his hands, he needs to move away from the car. And Williams, funnily enough, did the same thing in the Belgian Grand Prix about five years ago. Do you remember Bottas had the wrong tyres yeah, uh, yeah. on his car? Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you for your questions as ever. Do keep them coming in. Just email them to f1nation at f1.com. And we'll be back next week with our preview of the Dutch Grand Prix coming to you from Zandvoort. Thank you for listening and thank you as ever for your company, gentlemen. F1 Nation is produced by F1 and Audio Boom Studios.